Hey everybody, this is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. Hope you're all doing very well today. In this video, I'm going to tell you about an amazing ball player that I think should be in the Hall of Fame. In fact, a lot of people think that Bobby Vec here should be in the Hall of Fame decades ago. And before I get into his story, this is a 1921 American Caramel. And I'll show you the back of it just in case you guys haven't seen what they look like. Looks like that right there and there's something actually very interesting about what well, there we go this right here that mark I've seen that mark on a lot of these cards and I'm not entirely sure what it is I don't want to speculate but I have a, a sneaking suspicion that it is a um a, a particular check from the uh advertiser I have to figure that out a little bit more before I actually tell you guys exactly what it is. I know that there is a uh, another card set from like 1921 of American Caramel that has it, and it's extremely rare. Uh, however, um, and oh, and by the way, that particular issue was uh, first discovered about maybe three or four years ago. So it's similar, but not not really. So anyway, uh, as you guys can see right here. Uh, it says this set consists of pictures of 120 leading baseball stars. Now, there is another um, type, if you will, that has 80. Uh, you have that, but the, also what I think is kind of interesting, too, is that say like the 1916 M101 uh, series, you have about a dozen advertisers on the backs and they're all coming from the same printer. And I think that's actually the same uh, thing with this particular uh, set. There's uh, probably 15 to 20 different advertisers for uh, whoever printed these cards. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm, I'm very close. Uh, but the American uh, Caramel is the leading advertiser for whoever uh, printed the set and distributed it. So, you know, again, each uh, advertiser distributed their own sets. Uh, and I think maybe that they just ordered the uh, a bulk, if you will, from the, the printer like they did with the 1916 M101. And um, that uh, grouping of cards is a lot similar to the uh, 1909 T206. I, I will just tell you right off the bat though, that uh, each one is the same uh, picture, but it, obviously a different advertiser. And there's something that I came across about a dozen years ago that I actually didn't know about. But uh, if you're actually going to collect these, if you're actually gonna collect these particular cards, there is another set that looks very, very similar. Obviously, the, the appearance is, is very similar, but the back is not, and it's a black-backed card. So the way that you're going to be able to tell that these are 1921 coaster bread cards is the, the back. They're blank. But also, uh, this is uh, Dave Bancroft. He's a Hall of Famer, and I, I won't get into why he got in the Hall of Fame in this video, uh, or if he even deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. It's, a, it's an interesting case altogether, but he is a Hall of Famer, and he's with the New York Giants, and the 1921 Coaster Bread Set is from Baltimore, and uh, it was issued, I believe, in about October, around the same time as the World Series, the Yankees versus the Giants. And it's the only two teams that you're going to find within the 1921 Coaster Bread series. They are not easy to find at all, and a lot of collectors kind of glaze over them like a donut, if you will. And uh, I, I did that too at one point because I didn't know what they were. I just thought, oh, they're, they're blank back cards. Oh, whoop de do, right? Nobody likes a blank back card, <laughs> really. Uh, but it, it can be a little confusing for uh, novice collectors, and you know we were all novices at one point in time, and you know the the uh, only way that you 
don't become a novice is to do your research. And uh, I'll, I'll help you guys out as much as I can on this stuff because, you know, I, I had a great group of uh, older collectors that helped me out too. But I also had to learn about a lot of the stuff on my own. And sometimes the best way to learn is on your own and making mistakes. You should make mistakes, but don't make the same mistakes twice. So I'll, I'll try to help you guys out as much as possible on this and again, I don't know everything either, and I'm still coming across cards I've never seen before. And a lot of uh, these particular cards and the players I have never seen. So um, I'm kind of like reading about these guys. And one of the guys I read early on was Bobby Vec. There's a lot of people who really think that he does belong in the Hall of Fame, and I'm one of them. This card was not cheap, by the way. Uh, for a guy who's not in the Hall of Fame, I think I paid over 40 bucks for this particular card. And it kind of shows you that, you know, there are some people out there, uh, collectors, who definitely know their stuff. And I'm not the only one, which is great. But again, um, when I, I really wanted to, to learn about these players, there's not a whole lot of information out there. And um, even during his time, there's uh, scant uh, articles out there and so even in his uh, 1945 obituary I didn't read a whole lot out there all it said really was that he had passed away and that he was a part of an outfield that included Ty Cobb and Harry Heilman and those guys are in the Hall of Fame obviously Ty Cobb you know being one of the greatest ball players of his uh, generation and then Harry Heilman who is a Hall of Famer but unfortunately, a lot of people don't know who Harry Heilman is. He actually had a, uh, a batting average, I believe, once or twice during his career of over 400. So he was an amazing hitter, but he's largely forgotten as well. And this is the one thing that I think why Bobby Vec has been uh, kind of excluded from the Hall of Fame, uh, even that he has a, uh, a 310 lifetime batting average is that he um, he spent, I guess, the bulk of his career in the dead ball era from like 1912, and then he retired, I think, in about 1923 and 1924. And, um, you know, obviously uh, his his batting average would have been higher had, uh, you know, he I don't think he and, and Ty Cobb got along all that well, but um, he, he's got an amazing story. And, what player did get along with Ty Cobb? I can think of maybe one player that got along really well with him, and I, I did a video on him. But, again, that's that's neither here nor there. The, the problem here, I think, is that he was sandwiched between two really great ball players on the same team, and, and they kind of, like, overshadowed Bobby Vex's career. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about this in greater detail, and I think you're going to find it really interesting and uh, stick with me, and I'll tell you a little bit more on the backside of these articles. This is from the McLean County News, Calhoun, Kentucky, August 22nd, 1991. Beck was little known baseball great by Ken Ward. History seems to have forgotten Bobby Beck, a pair of baseball chroniclers wrote in the early 1980s. Part of one of the greatest outfields in baseball history, the hard-hitting McLean County native was overshadowed by teammate Ty Cobb. Robert Hayes Bobby Veck was born at Iceland on June 29, 1888, son of coal miner Mark and Sally Veck. Of Irish descent, the Vecks had two other sons, John and Will. In the years around 1905, what Robert Ken Chloe called Kid baseball teams existed around the area. The pitcher for Iceland, a hot shot strike thrower, was Bobby Veck. Kensha Chloe played for Sacramento, and Roscoe Downs played for Livermore. Both remembered Bobby Veck, remembered he struck them out. The Vecks left Iceland shortly afterwards, moving to Madisonville, then to Heron, Illinois. In 1910, Bobby entered professional baseball as a pitcher for the minor league team at Kanakaki, Illinois. Lacking speed and baseball running ability, he was not considered major league material. Playing for Peoria in 1911, however, 
he batted 297 and was converted to outfielder. The St. Louis Browns scout Charlie Barrett had joined the Peoria Club as a fundamentals coach and gave Beck specialized instruction. In 1912, now with Indianapolis, Bobby hit 285 and was picked up by the Detroit Tigers, playing 23 games and batting 342 to begin his major league career. From 1913 to 1923, Bobby Beck composed of a third of one of the most potent outfields in baseball history, consisting of Beck, left field, Ty Cobb, center field, and Sam Crawford until 1917, and Harry Heilman, 1913 to 1923, right field. The Tigers outfield consistently had a batting average well over 300. In the early 1980s, active and retired players, coaches, and managers were surveyed for their opinions on games and players. These experts picked the trio of Heilman, Cobb, and Beck as the fifth best outfield trio in baseball history. They rated the Yankees outfield of Joe DiMaggio, Charlie Keller, and Tommy Heinrich as the best. Bobby's obituary in the New York Times stated that Beck, Cobb, and Crawford chased many an opposing pitcher to the showers. Bobby Veck remains in the top 10 in almost every category in Detroit Tigers history. Games, at-bats, runs, hits, doubles, triples, total bases, RBI, and batting average. He led the league in doubles twice, 1915 and 1919, triples once, 1919, hits once, 1919, and RBI three times, 1915, 1917, and 1919. He drove in over 100 runs six different times. The show in 1919 was Bobby's best year when his 191 hits, 45 doubles, and 17 triples led the league. His 355 batting average placed second to teammate Cobb's 385, and he trailed only Babe Ruth in RBI. During his major league career, Beck had 2,064 hits, including 393 doubles, 147 triples, and 64 home runs. He stole 195 bases, scored 953 runs, and drove in 1,166. His best single game came in 1920 when he went 6-for-6 six six in a 12-inning contest. The intense and intensely disliked Ty Cobb, while manager in 1921, decided Veck was too good-natured and easy-going. He ordered fellow outfielder Heilman to ride Bobby, believing a mad Veck would play harder. The ploy may have worked. Bobby ended the career with a 338 batting average and drove in 128 runs. But Cobb never bothered to admit the sh- scheme was his and Vec and Heilman, once close friends, became permanently estranged. In 1923, Charlie Geringer, a future Hall of Famer, joined the Tigers organization because Vec talked the staff into giving the youngster a tryout. But Vec was not there to see his protégés rise to greatness. During the 1923 season, Cobb decided Vec lacked determination and hustle despite having averaged 338 and 327 the previous two seasons. He kept Bobby benched most of the season. Beck still managed to hit 327, pinch hitting and filling in. On January 12, 1924, Cobb got Bobby sold to the Boston Red Sox, who in turn traded him to the New York Yankees on May 9, 1925. He stayed with the Yankees only until August 17, 1925, when he went on waivers to the Washington Senators. During his short stay with the Yankees, Beck once pinch hit for Babe Ruth. During that time, the Yankees played the Tigers in Detroit. Tigers fans wildly jeered manager Cobb when Beck hit a double against his old club. Although now with another team, Beck remained one of the most popular players in Tigers history. In one season's closing weeks with Washington, Beck two out ninth inning single ended Ted Lyons' bid for a no-hitter. The Senators won the pennant 
and in the 1925 World Series, his only series appearance, Beck pitch hit against the New York Giants that ended his major league career. In 1926 through 1929, Bobby played for the Toledo Mud Hens of the American Association, and in 1928, at the age of 40, he won the American Association batting crown with a 382 average. He ended his baseball career in 1930 with Jersey City. At Detroit, Beck stood 5 foot 11 inches, weighed 160 pounds, and had gray eyes and dark hair. He threw right-handed, but batted left-handed. Sacramento native Robert Kinkloe saw Bobby during 1916 and 1917 when the Tigers would play in Washington, D.C. Kencha Chloe remembered him as a very neatly dressed and young, handsome, fine gentleman. Bob remembered his fellow McLean County ball player and made sure he had tickets when the Tigers played in Washington. After leaving baseball, Bobby Veck became a coal dealer in Detroit. He told Kencha Chloe that he had bought his parents a home in Heron, Illinois, apparently soon after entering the majors. On January 22, 1910, Vec married Ethel Claire Spiller. They had four sons. On January 7, 1945, after a long illness, Bobby Vec died at his home in Detroit. He was survived by his wife and three sons. Baseball historian Robert Kramer may have summed up Vec's career when he called the McLean County native, surely one of the least remembered of the really fine hitters. This is from the Detroit Free Press. May 6, 2006. Expert Pushes for VEC for Hall by Ernie Harwell. I first heard from Robert Kajurian last July when he wrote me urging the election of former Tiger outfielder Bobby VEC to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Since then, we have met often and I've learned a lot about VEC and began his, who began his career in 1912 and a lot about Ron, who is more than a knowledgeable baseball fan. He is an expert in several phases of the game and writes a column for the Sports Collector's Digest. His specialty is autographs, and he is one of the nation's outstanding authorities on forgery. Forgery is a hot topic in the world of collectors, and nobody knows more about the subject than Ron. But Ron's ongoing passion is his drive to persuade the Veterans Committee to elect Vec, who batted 355 in 1919, to the Hall of Fame. The committee does not vote again until January, but Ron already is into his campaign. He has a strong argument for Vec, one I heartily support, and today I'm donating this space for his observations about that Tiger's great. Here are the words of Ron Kajarian. The roll call of Tiger's past reads like a who's who of the game's immortals. The legends of Detroit baseball are, to this day, household names. Ty Cobb, Al Kaline, Charlie Geringer, Bobby Veck, and countless others have left their mark on baseball history. Bobby Veck? Bobby who? If you are asking yourself that, you are not alone. Mention that name, Vec, and the usual response is a blank stare. Vec was one of the early stars of the dead ball era. Long ago, the Detroit club had an arsenal of great players. First and foremost among them was Ty Cobb. Now, if you are playing in the same outfield as Cobb, you will tend to be overlooked. Such was the misfortune of the hard-hitting Vec. Time seems to have steamrolled over the memory of Vec, and today the old Tigers' war horse is all but forgotten. Vec is one of those players who patiently waited for the call from the Baseball Hall of Fame. His record certainly speaks for itself. In a career that lasted 14 years, he smacked 2,064 base hits and secured a 310 lifetime batting average. A powerful batsman by trade, Vec captured the American League RBI crown three times. Yet despite his Hall of Fame numbers, there is no bronze plaque in Cooperstown bearing the name of the great Bobby Vec. New York Giants Hall of Famer Carl Hubble 
Lawrence summed it up best. I am under the impression that Bobby Vec is in the Hall of Fame, he said. If not, he certainly belongs there. Some day Vec will take his rightful place in Cooperstown alongside Cobb and the rest of baseball's immortals. Some day Bobby Vec will find his way into the Hall of Fame and will be forgotten no more. And then you can contact Ernie Harwell at Detroit Free Press, 600 West Fort Street, Detroit. Uh, but you can't do that anymore unless you uh, contact him by a seance because he's dead. Uh, I'm such a jerk. I'm such a jerk. On uh, And Ernie Harwell is also in the uh, Hall of Fame in the writer's wing. So I, I was reading an article from 1925 about Bobby Veck's time on the Washington Senators, and this article is right after the Senators lost the World Series to the Pirates. And first off, the Pirates were madmen back in the 1920s. Uh, they're like, well, I, I would say they're like the 1986 New York Mets of the 1920s. They were just out of control, but they had amazing teams on the, uh, the Pirates. And they went to the World Series twice, 1925 and 1927. And they, they won in 1925. And a lot of uh, people had actually said that Vec was the reason why the Washington Senators lost. But um, when they spoke to Walter Johnson, he said, you know, that's BS, basically. Uh, Vec really had nothing to do with the, uh, the 1925 uh, Series loss. And uh, what they had said was that um, <clears throat> somebody was giving out signals uh, to which pitch that Walter Johnson would throw. And, and uh, Johnson, he had no idea that what he was actually doing was he was handing over signals unintentionally to the Pirates. And that's how the Pirates were able to uh, win the, the championship. Now, what they had actually said was that uh, Vec was the one who was... Uh, giving the uh, the signals to the Pirates. That's not true at all. It was a, a writer who had suggested that. And, and then they followed up with Walter Johnson saying that that's not true at all. There's no way that he could have done that. Even He's on our team. Um, and that's actually the only World Series that Vec was in. The uh, As good as the Detroit Tigers were back in uh, Vec's era, they didn't get to the World Series. Um, just because there were, you know, the, the Yankees and in the Giants, for the most part, the Yankees were, were um, so stacked that it would be really difficult for, for Cobb. And you have to remember, too, that Cobb is really kind of in a different generation, if you will, of ball players. He's the more the hit and run kind of guy because he's he's dealing more with like uh, how baseball was played during the the. Uh, dead ball era and then all of a sudden comes the live ball and it's a di completely different game especially with Babe Ruth coming in and hitting all these home runs and I, I remember hearing uh, stories or reading stories in the in the press saying well, we got to stop all these home runs Babe Ruth is destroying the game he's hitting so many home runs we only have so many baseballs that we can produce so they were really upset with Babe Ruth hitting all these home runs but you know, he changed baseball forever. And guys like Ty Cobb really couldn't adapt very well. Um, I mean, hitting the ball is one thing, but the crowd, the fans wanted to see Babe Ruth hit home runs. And these guys were just not home run hitters. I thought that was really interesting. As I recall, I think that Bobby Veck only was up for a Hall of Fame consideration once in like 1937. And he really is forgotten. It's it's incredible. But there are a lot of ball players that we might not know today because we're obviously uh, generations removed from when these players played. And even when they retired, they weren't in the uh, the news media. And obviously, uh, you know, Bobby Veck he passed away in 1945. So, um, you know, my grandparents may have actually seen him play. Uh, at least my, my grandfather might have, or my grandmother. I, I kind of doubt that, though. Uh, my grandmother was really a, a Cardinals fan in the 1920s, and I'm not sure if my grandfather actually watched or listened to baseball games, uh, but I, I know my grandmother was uh, highly uh, in tune to the St. Louis Cardinals of the 20s and 30s. 
Uh, that being said, though, um, you know, it is, I think, really difficult uh, for a guy like Bobby Vec to actually get in the Hall of Fame because of his two teammates. Not his fault, per se, although reading that article, uh, the first one, <laughs> Ty Cobb really was a supreme jerk, and there's no two ways about it. And then, you know, Harry Heilman, uh, it's really too bad uh, that uh, Heilman and, and Vec, they didn't get along after. And I'll, I'll talk about Harry Heilman in another video. He's obviously in the Hall of Fame, and his stats are just unbelievable, amazing. And it's, you know, again, one of the reasons why Vec is, is so forgotten today. You know, you do have three people out in the, uh, the outfield there, and um, I, I would actually love to see Bobby Vec up for Hall of Fame consideration uh, by the Veterans Committee again and just see what happens. Uh, anyway, guys, I thought this would be a, a really nice introduction to Bobby Vec. And I'd love to hear what you guys have to say, whether or not he has the uh, the credentials, if you will, to get into the Hall of Fame. And if you have any of his cards, which one do you like? Um, for me personally, the 1921 uh, American Caramel fits great. I, I like I like the cards. I, I love the uh, the photography in those uh, sets. He also has a uh, 1915 Cracker Jack as well. Those Cracker Jacks are really expensive now. Um, when I was uh, a kid, I could get Cracker Jacks fairly cheap. Today, it's, it's a real struggle. You know, the struggle is real. But um, I, I really like his story, and I've, I've heard about Bobby Vec for quite some time. I just haven't done a video on him because there's so many players that I want to cover and kind of share with you guys. So, again, thank you guys so much. I greatly appreciate it, as always. And let me know what you think about Bobby Vec, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.